Welcome to What is Going Om for new thought from the edge of Om. Each week on Om Times flagship radio show, veteran broadcaster, author, and media consultant Sandy Sedgbeer conducts thought provoking interviews with inspirational authors, artists, musicians, scientists, speakers, and filmmakers who are working at the point where spirituality and science meet consciousness at the very edge of Om. Here is your host, Sandy Sedgbeer. Hello. Earlier this year, I had a fascinating discussion with award-winning author and film critic, Dean, I'm sorry, Dean, <laughs> Sting Slighty. Your name is one of those that always gets me. I always that, have to stop and think that was it. That was the hardest part. From here on, That's it's all the easy. Part. From here on, it's going to get easier. <laughs> so earlier this year, I had a fascinating discussion with award-winning author and film critic, Dean Slighter about his most recent book, The Dharma Bum's Guide to Western Literature, Finding Nirvana in the Classics, which inspires listeners to deepen their own spiritual life and see literature as a path of awakening. But long before Dean wrote The Dharma Bum's Guide, he published an equally inspiring book called Cinema Nirvana, Enlightenment Lessons from the Movies, which according to one reviewer, compels us to watch the movies in the way a Buddha might see them. Dean Slater has taught authentic traditional approaches to meditation and awakening since 1970. He's the author of several best-selling books and he gives talks workshops and retreats throughout the United States and beyond. And he's been featured on National Public Radio, Coast to Coast, The Dr. Oz Show, New York Times and Oprah Magazine. Dean joins me today to discuss Cinema Nirvana, in which he illuminates the hidden enlightenment teachings of movies like Casablanca, Jaws, The Graduate, The Godfather, Memento and 10 other classic films, revealing spiritual wisdom in everything from 007 Secret Weapons to the Colour of the Seven Dwarves' Eyes. Dean Slater, welcome. Thanks so much. It's great to be back, Sandy. <laughs> it's good to have you, Dean. I want to kick off this dis discussion by quoting something you wrote in Cinema Nirvana, which was, when sex is good, it's really good, but when it's bad, it's still pretty good. And that's how you feel about movies, even big, bad, dumb ones like Independence Day, you oh, say. Right. So right. tell us about your love affair with movies, which started when you were, what, six years old? Yeah, something like that. Um, I was um, uh, a little kid growing up in Westbury, Long Island, and we saw a film. Well, we can date that. We could check the date of the film around 1955, 56, Forbidden Planet. Um, uh, which had the, the spooky theremin music and woo and the, um, the great special effects. My brothers and I were just completely in love with, there, there was the, uh, the id monster, I believe it was, which was some kind of like giant lion made out of lightning sparks, leave you walking around invisibly leaving footprints in the, in the sand of, of the, whatever the planet was. And uh, so, yeah, wow, what's not to love? Well, I mean, you certainly seem to see things in movies that most of us don't see after reading the book. I'm really mm -hmm. having to think back and go, oh, yes, how come I missed that? Yeah. Um, so you say that movies are the expression of our collective yearnings and we all yearn for spiritual mastery, whether we know it or not. So tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, well, that piece also started for me in childhood. Uh, I had some kind of spontaneous opening experiences uh, that I just sort of bumped into. Um, one of them actually I describe at the beginning of the Dharma Bums Guide, the, the, my, my Mad Magazine epiphany, uh, mm -hmm. where we're seeing the, the face of grinning Alfred E. Newman and his motto, what me worry? suddenly made all my worries fall away and my kind of top of my skull opened up to the sky and kind of just got socked into, you know, cut it with a knife, eat it with a spoon nirvana for the rest of the day and the evening. So, yeah, both of these things were going on early on. And uh, so after a while, I started uh, connecting the dots. And I would 
uh, walk out of a movie with my my then wife, which is my late first wife, Maggie, <clears throat> and and I'd say, oh, you know, when this thing happened, look, this character, and that's, you know, the look at the seven dwarfs' eyes, this guy. And, uh, <laughs> and I would start talking her ear off, and she would say, honey, why don't you go over to the computer and, and write this stuff down? So that eventually became the book. The book and by the way, the, co the, co the cover design... Uh, with the the golden Buddha clutching the the box of popcorn, uh, I was a little. That was my idea, and uh, I was a little concerned. Gee, is this too irreverent? So I checked with a couple of my, you know, and I I have teachers in various traditions. So I went back to my Buddhist teachers and asked them, "Is this okay?" And they all laughed. They said, "Oh yeah, it's great." Do you think the Buddha would take a you know a box of popcorn into the movies? Uh yeah, you know, it's good, healthy vegetarian food. Yeah. The Buddha yeah. actually, you know, when the the represent the the iconic representation of the Buddha, he's always holding his his begging bowl. So historically, that's you know, he was a a, a mendicant itinerant monk mm -hmm. traveling around with the begging bowl. You see people like that to this day in India and thereabouts. But the the kind of deeper the archetypal meaning of that is that, uh, as we say, beggars can't be choosers. The tradition is anything that's dropped into the begging bowl, you have to eat. You mm. don't say, oh, I'm a vegetarian, or oh, sorry, you know, I'm gluten-free. Um, and this is the model for how we meditate. Mm -hmm. That, you know, people think of meditation as, oh, picking and choosing, okay, this is the good experience, this is the bad experience, this is, but really, and this is, you know, just the crucial thing that I've learned from my teachers, it's a matter of sitting wide open to whatever comes. And and more and more that becomes how how life, <laughs> the model for your life in the other 23 hours of the day. And then also for me, this becomes the model of how I write these books. Mm. You know, Emily Dickinson wrote, not knowing when the dawn will come, I open every door. Right. So you never know what direction or at what moment the light is going to come in or or in what form. Uh, I may have mentioned to you in, a, in one of our previous talks, one one of my fav very favorite moments in my life was eating breakfast one day and, and there was a carton of Tropicana orange juice. And I realized what was written on the side of the carton was the perfect, concise meditation instruction. It said nothing added nothing taken away, not from concentrate. I said, there it is. <laughs> there it was, yeah. <laughs> right. So, so, this is, so this is what I bring to movies. The other yeah. thing that I, that I bring, and, and I, I mentioned this in, in, in the book, in Cinema Nirvana, is that I was fortunate uh, enough to visit Tibet and, and go through a lot of temples in Tibet with Charles Genou, who is a just brilliant Buddhist teacher from Switzerland, and he's a, a world-recognized authority on iconography. So we'd go into temple after temple and looking at all the rupas and the tankas, and you'd point out, okay, this Buddha has five points on his crown, this one has four points on his crown, this one's wearing a purple undershirt, this one's wearing a yellow undershirt, and showing how all of those, those things are uh, they're, none of them are arbitrary. None of them are merely decorative. They're all indicating different aspects of the whole adventure of the of the unfolding of our awareness into awakening. So this is the approach that I took. Okay, what if I look at movies? What if I look at the 007's weapons? What if I look at the colors of the seven dwarf size? You, you, it, it makes you alert to look for those things, and then you have mm -hmm. to start start unpacking them. Yeah, yeah, you do. And you say in the book that you deliberately skipped over films where the spiritual content was too little, literal or obvious. So mm -hmm. presumably movies like Shangri-La, you know, you've yes. skipped over those. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. So did you find it difficult to, you know, to just come up with what, is it about 17 books, that, uh, 17 movies that you've covered? 15 movies. 15? No, I found yeah. it difficult to limit myself to that uh, because this wound up being a what a 300 page 300 page book and 
you know, I had to leave out things. There's no chapter on Hitchcock. Uh, you know, I, 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 I would love, I, I've got a whole riff I can do on, on, on uh, rear window, north by northwest, strangers on a train. You know, we could do oh, a whole, whole we could do a whole book on the Dharma of Hitchcock. Um, there's, there's a whole newsletter, a monthly newsletter, right there. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. The, well, the other thing is, you said, I want to stick with familiar domestic fare as mm -hmm. our way into the supposedly unfamiliar exotic realm of enlightenment, to which my answer is, you stick into familiar domestic fare. Do you not think then that British films and European films hold any enlightenment? Oh, no, no, absolutely. They, they, they do. But what, but, you know, I just assumed I was writing, first of all, for an American audience. Uh, I mean, you know, we we can we can spend the next hour talking about wings of desire. We can spend the next next week talking about eight and a half. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, ab absolutely. But so but but American films are known to Americans and they're known worldwide by a popular audience. So That's I, absolutely true. Right. Yeah. So yeah. so what yeah. so what I realized was I want to connect something familiar with something unfamiliar, and for for most people the the whole the insights of enlightenment are the unfamiliar thing you know, this mm. comes also from my days as a school teacher as as you know i i taught literature and 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 writing for 33 years at a, a ritzy prep school in new jersey and um you know what i realized was okay if you're going to talk about huckleberry finn and connect it to the lives of these my adolescent students you don't start with, here's this thing in Huck Finn, and now here's this thing in your life. You start with, oh, here's this thing in your life, and here's this thing in Huck Finn. So you're always extrapolating from the familiar to the unfamiliar. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's uh, take a look at a few of these movies mm -hmm. and what you've got to stay, say about them. And we're going to start oh. with Snow White. Yes. And you say Disney's Snow White is a passive fairy tale heroine who climbs no beanstalks and slays no dragons. If we view the film on a strictly literal level, however, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs is an extended Dharma parable. So yeah. It, it, well, yeah. If we, if we, Read it on a strictly. Actually, you had the period in the wrong place there, if I may. It, she, she's she's a passive, slays no dragons. If we read it on a strictly literal level. Oh right, okay. Per, yeah. Period. Yeah. However, <laughs> right. okay. Sorry, but I've got to parse that one to make it make sense here. As a good uh, teacher would. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm trying to do this gently. So, right. So on a literal level, she's, uh, you know, she's a feminist nightmare. She's like the the old um, the old uh, 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 Barbie doll that when you you pull the the ring on her back, she said, "Ooh, math is hard." <laughs> they really used to make that. <laughs> In the I've never days. had a Barbie doll in my life. <laughs> uh -huh. um, congratulations. Um, so, so yeah, you know, uh, what what are her talents? Uh, uh, cleaning up the house and waiting for her prince charming to come. That's that's it. So, so on a literal level, yeah, she's it's terrible. Um, <clears throat> but if we look at it on a deeper level, um. One thing that that I, I always find useful is look for things that don't make sense logically. Um, so, and, and and as a matter of fact, when when we talk about Jaws, remind me that because there's there's some something very important there that's completely illogical that no one ever notices. Um, on my list. Well, they're on my list. The movie's yeah, on good. my list, yes. Yeah. Good, good. So in, in, in Snow White, we start with the her wicked stepmother, the queen. Um, and what's interesting is when we whenever we see the queen, she's sitting alone in her big castle. Where are the where's the king? Where are the ladies in waiting? Where is the she's all by herself? It doesn't make sense on the literal level. It makes perfect sense if we read it on the psychological or spiritual or archetypal level, and we see that, oh, the queen is ego. The queen is ego. The queen is, is completely invested in 
right? Magic mirror on the wall who is the fairest of them all. And there's only one <laughs> acceptable answer to that question, right? And so this is all of us when we're invested in ego. We have to be the fairest of them all, the smartest, the hippest, the, the tallest, the, the, the whatever. Um, and, you know, if we really scramble, if we're really, we get lucky with our genes or, you know, circumstances or something, then we might succeed in being the somethingest of them all for a little while. But then, you know, we, we, we're, if, if that's the basis of our feeling of okayness in life, then, uh, we're, we're, everything is a threat. Everyone is a threat sooner or later. The magic mirror is going to tell us, Oh, you're, you're not the, you're not the uh, the champ anymore. You've lost the election. <laughs> right. Little situation we we're dealing with over here yeah, on our side of the pond. It, yeah. Well, yeah, we've had you, our share you, of that too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You've you've time for you to Brexit. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, so when she discovers that wait, Snow White is now the fairest of them all. She, she gives orders to have Snow White killed. That's unacceptable. Now, Snow White. Again, if we read this on a literal level, is this some terrible racist thing, you know, where, where, where white skin, her skin is as white as the snow, you know, that this is seen as the ultimate virtue. So on that level, it yeah, doesn't, doesn't work well for us. On the, Deeper level, and and here are the, the the times that I spent studying with Tibetan Buddhist teachers was very helpful. Um, there's this, uh, there are these expressions um, of d descriptions of the pure awareness, which is our original nature, which is which is our primordial beingness, primordial awareness. But it's like the we could say the the pure, brilliant, luminous, lit up screen of awareness before anything starts playing on the screen, mm. which is still there all the time, and which is that that's that's the location of enlightenment, a way re recognizing that, recognizing that, getting back to that original awareness and seeing oh that's been underlying all this movie of of life all along. Otherwise, we wouldn't able be able to have all this activity, all this you know, speech and thought and feeling and and you know interaction with the environment. We couldn't have this awareness of A B C D X Y Z without having awareness. Period. Now, Snow White is that awareness, that mm -hmm. that pure awareness. Um, when she <clears throat> and that makes perfect sense of the the queen's jealousy the ego is always jealous of the true self of our true identity because to to recognize our true identity would knock the 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 the, the ego off of its throne this is why we find excuses not to meditate Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, because you know, and we say, "Oh, I'm so busy today," or "There's, oh, I'm not in the mood." And what it really is is because who's saying that? Ego speaking through its prime minister, which is the mind thinking, making up all these reasons why I don't have time to meditate today. But the real reason is I don't want to die. Right, ego doesn't want to d d die, give up its throne, and melt. You know, like. And, and there's so many symbols, like in the Wizard of Oz, the Wicked Witch of the West, when when finally at the end, right, the scarecrow throws water on her. I'm melting. Right, that's mm. what ego is is af is afraid of all the time. <clears throat> and we have in the Bible everywhere, you know, that's King Herod, all the evil kings in in Shakespeare. It's it's Claudius, uh, it's Macbeth. They're they're all representations of ego. So Snow White runs away, comes to the cottage of the seven dwarfs. The seven dwarfs are out working in their mind, digging, digging up diamonds and rubies. Now, what are the seven dwarfs? Happy, grumpy, etc. And by the way, you know, the old fairy tale of, of, of Snow White and the seven dwarfs was around, of course, for many years before Disney got hold of it. And there were even early... 
um, silent film versions of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. But in all of those, the dwarfs were identical. They didn't have identities. One of Disney's strokes of genius was to give each dwarf a name, an identity, a distinguishing trait. And he tried on all kinds, you know, uh, uh, jumpy and hungry and so forth, and finally arrived at the the, the seven that we know. Um, you know, happy, grumpy, sleepy, sneezy, doc, dopey. I think I left somebody out. Um, <clears throat> so what do those have to do with us? What do those have to do with, with our consciousness? Well, how often do we say, gee, I'm happy. And then, you know, in the next day or in the next minute, you say, uh, I'm grumpy. Right. Now, if I'm going to take you at your word, take you literally and say, wait, 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 make up your mind. You just made a, a, one statement about your identity. You said that you're happy. Then you said that you're, you're grumpy. Which one are you? So what that's showing us is, you know, that's if we take the, the word am as like an equal sign. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So what we're really saying is, no, that's not what I, and interesting, not every language does that. You know, in Spanish, they don't say, I am hungry. They say, uh, yo tengo hambre, I, I have hunger. That's really mm. more, more accurate. Also, by the way, while we're at it, let me point out, English is the one language where we capitalize I and we lowercase you. Spanish is the opposite. We cap they capitalize usted and lowercase yo. <laughs> you know, what, Never what's thought of that. What's the psychology of that? Yeah, right. yeah. And anyway, um, so all of these, these, you know, happy, grumpy, sleepy, these are traits. These are not what we are. It's not really accurate to say I am sleepy. It's these are modes of functioning, modes of expression. Right? I'm functioning in a sleepy way at the moment. I'm functioning in a grumpy way at mm -hmm. the moment and so forth. And that's why it makes sense that they're dwarfs. They're small things. They're smaller than our identity. Right? They're, 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 they don't have the full dignity of what we truly are. Right? However, we make the mistake, pre-enlightenment, we make the mistake of falsely identifying ourselves with all these things. That's where ego comes in. Right? I am, I am this, I, and that's, that's, that's eventually always a fatal mistake to make because then we're always identifying with things that are smaller than what we really are and with things that are are um uh impermanent and then we try to make them permanent and disaster ensues so what we need to do is bring together these these um passing impermanent dynamic traits which are perfectly fine and necessary in their place and we need to integrate them with pure awareness with the true self. So in other words, Snow White has to come to the cottage of the seven dwarfs. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, and that's what happens. Now she happens to show up while they're out at work and she sees what a mess their little cottage is. Well, that makes perfect sense because when we're only living in our, in our traits, in our relative expression, without the influence of pure awareness, it's a mess. Right? Our life gets messy. So what does she do? She immediately starts cleaning everything up, sweeping the floor, washing the dishes, whistle while you work, and gets the place cleaned up. This is the thing that, that people notice when they start doing serious spiritual practice. They start meditating regularly. They notice, uh, gee, when's the last time I had a cigarette? That's mm -hmm. very common. They, they, you don't have to go, oh, I'm going to quit smoking. It is fine. Gee, when did that fall away? You know, my um, when I first started going off on weekend meditation retreats, way back at the beginning of my meditation career, after I came back from the third or fourth one, my, my girlfriend at the time said, you know what? Every time you come back from one of these things, you're a little nicer. And I said, I am? I wasn't trying to be nicer. I, I hadn't even noticed that I was nicer, but okay, I'll take that. I'll take your word for it. Um, our, we, we start to clean up. Our act starts to get cleaned up 
right? Mm -hmm. um, and interestingly, after she does all that cleaning, she's tired. She goes upstairs to the bedroom. She sees all their little beds with each one has this name carved in the headboard. And she lies crosswise across the beds and, and falls asleep. So right there in that image, there, I mean, that's an image you could put in a Tibetan temple, right? There's, there's the absolute, infinite, pristine awareness, original nature, like, like the untrammeled, ever-virginal snow. And there are the traits, the, the modes of expression uh, that it needs to be integrated with. And then, you know, eventually they come home and yada, yada, yada. They have a big party, a big hoedown. And that's like the celebration of that integration, right? But there's yeah. still one thing missing. There's still one thing missing. It's, it's one thing to have to integrate this pure awareness with our traits in the day-to-day -day world. And often, you know, these days especially, or at least out here in Los Angeles especially, meditation is often kind of sold like that. Okay, you get meditation so you can, you know, you can you can crush the opposition at work. Uh, yeah, okay, it's fine. It, it's true. It will enhance your ability to crush the opposition at work. But if that's all it was about, I would never be interested. You know, some of us. We're interested in the deep thing, which is which is the enlightenment. Mm -hmm. um, enlightenment is Prince Charming, and Prince Charming makes his first appearance in the film way back at the beginning, when when uh, Snow White is still the first time we see her. She's scrubbing the steps. She's dressed in rags because she's the neglected stepchild, right? Our original nature, until we bring it forward into the foreground into enlightenment it's it's shoved to the background it, it, it's the neglected stepchild of our life right and she's scrubbing the steps right she again cleaning trying to clean up the act and she looks into the well and she sings the song about wishing i'm wishing for the one i love and the prince charming on his snow white horse mounted on his snow white horse right because right because enlightenment is our own nature it's drawn to us this is why effort in meditation is not only unnecessary but it's a mistake you know any effort to create a non-agitated state of mind is a form of agitation yeah. Yeah. This is the, the catch-22 of meditation. This is why people say, oh, I tried to meditate, but it was hard. And I say, no, 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 you tried to meditate, and therefore it was hard. And the thing I was you know, so fortunate to learn from my teachers is don't try, don't push, allow yourself to be pulled. Right. So the horse, by its nature, being also snowing, is just drawn somehow Prince Charming knows to come and scale the wall and come into the garden. And the first time that she sees him, she's looking down into the waters of the well, right? She's, she's in this very graceful, rounded posture, looking down. It's, that's us looking within. She's looking within herself, within her own nature. And, the, and she, she sees her reflection, and suddenly he appears in her reflection along with her. And that's the, the foreshadowing of, oh, this is destined from the start for our nature, our original nature, to, to, to meet its Prince Charming, its full blossoming and enlightenment. Right? But the first time they meet, she gets shy, she runs away. And this is what, what happens so much at the beginning of our meditation career, right? It's like, oh, there it is. I got a glimpse of it. And, and then it ran away. You know, the, the, in, in Japanese, you know, the, in Zen tradition, they call that Kensho. It, 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 we get the glimpse and then it runs away. Um, so yada, yada, yada. We're, I'm going on for quite a bit. You know what? I'm, I'm getting so yeah. drawn into this that I'm, you know, I'm almost meditating I'm going to leave us no time for anything um, but else. But we, we do need to take a break. Right. And um, when we come back, if we can, if we can kind of... It's fascinating, and I wish we had, you know, <laughs> a show every week on all of these movies. For, for, with, for, um, to get the exciting conclusion, read the book. 
Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. OK, we'll take a break now, Dean, and we'll be back in a few moments. You're listening to What Is Going On. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, and my guest today is speaker, workshop leader, meditation teacher and award winning author and film critic Dean Slater. And we're talking about his book, Cinema Nirvana, Enlightenment Lessons from the Movies. We'll be back with more from Dean after the break. Om Times TV. Imagine becoming a super influencer. Reinvent yourself, invest in your brand, and then manifest your success with a robust, spheric approach. Own Times Media and Broadcasting offers a unique and multifaceted way to become the spiritual and conscious influencer you deserve to be by putting your message across our powerful platform with its proven record of integrity and excellence. Through our produced shows, Own Times offers the opportunity to become a social media TV personality, a radio show host, an Own Times magazine columnist, and a syndicated podcaster, all in one shot. By live streaming your show on Ohm Times TV and broadcasting it across the extensive Ohm Times radio and TV networks, you become more than a host. You become an ambassador and a force for positive change. Ohm Times, open yourself to the possibilities. If I could be you, and you could be me for just one hour. If we could find a way to get inside each other's minds Walk a mile in my shoes Walk, Walk a, a mile, mile in my shoes. my shoes Well, before you abuse, criticize and accuse Walk, Walk a mile in my shoes Welcome back. Dean Slicer, if you could quickly tell us what the most important thing that we could possibly learn from Snow White is, um, we may have time to discuss a few more. Um, <laughs> the most important thing is... Yeah. Um, the big takeaway. Uh, is um, uh, relax. <laughs> Relax that'll and be, the, the, that'll be the answer. That'll be the answer with regard to any anything you ask every, me. Every single one. Yeah, absolutely. Every any yeah. every film, every book, everything else. Just relax. It's so interesting, you know, the way that you um the way that you see things in these movies and then the way that you explain them is is such a big aha certainly for me mm -hmm. um you know if i can't look at them the same way again but i think you know for the sake of our audience you you have jaws in that book you have mm -hmm. the godfather mm -hmm. you have goldfinger mm -hmm. uh you talk about jaws and you say that uh um, it's usually seen as a movie about terror, but you think it's about insatiable hunger, mm -hmm. our hunger, mm -hmm. uh, the Godfather. You talk about how we can find hints at the infinite looming in the way Sonny Colleone dies at the toll booth. And uh, you talk about Bond as a bud budding Buddha. Um, how do you see these things? I just... I'm blown away by you know. I want to be inside your head and looking out through your eyes. Uh, I don't know. It's 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 a bit of a three ring circus in here. Uh, I I I I'm just wired that way. This is this is what I do. I can't I can't I don't know how to become this way. I was kind of born this way, I guess. Do you do you find yourself in? You know, obviously, you've done it with literature. You've done it with movies. Do mm -hmm. you find that you know every dinner party? that you attend, that you can come away and you could recreate those conversations and in a whole new way? No. No, oh, okay. <laughs> no, 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 now you're talking about actual, actual humans here on the earth plane. That's, that's, that's not always my strong suit. But it is actual humans well, who I'll write come, these movies. I'll come away, I'll come, I'll come away from, from the dinner party and, and my wife will tell me what happened. Okay. All right. Well, tell me about a little bit about Jaws. Why do you say it's about hunger? Our well, hunger. It, it our is hunger a, for what? It, 
it, it is a film about terror from the point of view of the human characters, but I look at it from the shark's point of view. And, and I believe that the film is structured to at least subliminally put us in the shark's shoes, so to speak, if sharks wore shoes. Um, think of what is the very, if you ask people, what's the very first shot in Jaws? And usually they'll say, oh, it's the pretty blonde girl in the water swimming in the moonlight and suddenly she's pulled down. No, before that. Oh, yeah. Before that, she's at a party on the beach and then she and, and the boyfriend go running. And I go, no, 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 no. Before that, the very first shot under the opening credits, the camera is going through the water like this, cutting through the seaweed and past the minnows and so forth. And clearly that's the that's a a shark's eye view shot yeah yeah you know when when you look from up here that's called a bird's eye view this is a shark's eye view shot so it's literally putting us behind the eyeballs the beady little eyeballs of the shark what's it doing as it cuts through the water it's looking for food right you know the shark has to keep you know at some point the richard dreyfus character says you know this is an eating machine um so what is it in us that is insatiably hungry, you know? And what it is, is uh, we are hungry for the infinite. We're hungry for the infinite because we, we, we are infinite. Our awareness is infinite. We keep trying to fill it up with finite things. Some philosopher, I think it was Pascal, said, man is born with a God-shaped hole in him, and he spends his life trying to fill it with other things. Right. So just, yeah, amen to that. But to put it in more secular terms and in, in non non theistic Buddhist terms, right, we're born with uh, we're dissatisfied because we are the infinite and we keep trying to fill up that infinite awareness that we are with finite objects. And, and they, you know, a lot of them will do a pretty good job of um, impersonating infinite awareness of impersonating nirvana for a while but then there's always a point where it's mm, okay what next what next you know the shark has to keep feeding mm. now, i mentioned earlier that i always look for things that don't make sense on the yeah. logical level because that means that that especially if people always go past them like the why is the 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 queen always all by herself in the castle right now the thing like that in Jaws is that when our three heroes go out to hunt for the killer shark, they go into the deep water. They go out of sight of land. That makes no sense. The shark has been attacking people at the beach, right, right near the beach. So it makes no sense to go out into the deep water logically. Psychologically, it makes perfect sense because if the, the shark is the small self, the hungry ego. Um, to confront that, we have to go into the deep waters, right? The deep waters of life, the deep waters of consciousness. We can't just play around in the in the in the shallows. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point, actually. I mean, it, it, it's all metaphor, isn't it? It's all metaphor. Yeah, it's it's all metaphor. Everything's metaphor. Yeah everything this, yeah. this whole this whole this whole finite world is a metaphor for the infinite yeah yeah <laughs> so tell us why you say that james bond is a budding buddha james bond budding buddha yeah he's the he's the secret agent he's the he's 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 the double o seven you know the double the double o he's 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 basically to be double O is it means you're a manifestation of 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 the nothingness, of the no thingness, of the infinite, right? And seven would be the you know if seven is like full manifestation, like the seven classical planets, the seven chakras, so you know so on and so forth, um, the seven colors. Uh, so he's got the full panoply of of expression at his disposal. Um, he he's cool 
you know this is the this is the the one great distinguishing trait about bond no matter what happens to him you know he can be shaken but he's not stirred <laughs> right um and and that is that is our our budding buddha nature and it has to be covert for a while right as it confronts and you know the the bond villains are always um again manifestations of our deluded self you know goldfinger is mm -hmm. is greed okay we think if we ha can have enough money enough gold mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and goldfinger has this whole speech monologue that he makes about you know why gold is the divine heaviness of gold is 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 what he he craves um you know so gold, gold is again is a pretty good does a pretty good impersonation of nirvana for a while but then then what next so we have to slay goldfinger we have to we have to conquer our our inner goldfinger and, and we, could, we could we could do the same with dr no right dr no oh that's our that's our trait of negativity the part of us that mm. just says no to everything that says no to life lives on its, its isolated little island and so forth this is the mm. essay question for your viewers you can go through all the bond villains and identify what version of our deluded self they yeah. represent. When every single, um, you know, protagonist is, it's all about power, isn't it? It's about control, wanting yeah. to be mm -hmm. the biggest, you know, ego right? as well. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Be the, okay. The I, the, I can see the, that. Be the one, one on the throne. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, if we approach going to the, cinema in a different way now after reading mm -hmm. your book i mean mm -hmm. how can we then apply that awareness to our lives well i would say if we want a real action plan if you're really asking you know what what we do here uh i would say you know step one is meditate is 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 really you know everything is telling you um the the inf you're looking for the infinite in every moment everything you do the fact that you're watching this broadcast right now the fact that uh after this you're gonna go out and and you know order up a plate of of, of eggs or or smoke a cigarette or take a walk or read a book or make a phone call whatever you do every moment every action that you take you're you're seeking infinite awareness when you when you walk into the the ice cream parlor and you you know you're, <clears throat> you're reading the menu deciding what flavor of ice cream to get what you really want is nirvana it's not on the menu so you'll settle for you know mint chip or rocky road what whatever um seems like the most reasonable impersonation of nirvana at the moment now when you get the ice cream and i love ice cream right let me go get some right after this. So, so you find you get say, okay, I want ice cream. I want ice cream. I want ice cream. Finally, you get the ice cream and you go, ah, oh, now I'm happy, which for that moment you are. So we assume, oh, this happiness in the ice cream. But if we take the ice cream into the lab, put it under the electron microscope, tear it apart, we'll find molecules of carbon and oxygen and hydrogen and all the you won't find any happiness molecules now what that tells us is the happiness there's only one other place where the happiness can be and that's us and that what's going on is that at the moment you know we're craving 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 we satisfy that craving at that moment we stop craving and we fall back within ourselves we fall back within and contact that infinite awareness ah so the ah of when we have the ice cream, the ah when we have the orgasm, the ah when when our team scores the goal, it's they're they're all different triggering mechanisms, but they're all the same ah, because there's only one ah and it's in here. That's what all the sages are telling us. Now meditation is the direct path. Meditation is let what if what if I can do this without with or without the plate of ice cream, with or without the orgasm, with or without my team scoring the goal, right? And this particularly, you know, was driven home to me in, in the, the time that I've spent 
uh, teaching meditation to guys in prison, guys in maximum security. I've had guys who've gotten locked up in, in isolation for six months at a time, you know, which is brutal. It's a, it's a completely inhumane thing designed to drive people in out of their minds, really. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. you know, and then they come back and say, yeah, it was tough at first, but then I remembered, oh, thank God I know how to meditate. I'll just turn this into a meditation retreat because, you know, there's, there's going to be nothing giving me happiness out here. It's a good thing it's in here. Right. And this is what all the sages say. The kingdom of heaven is within. It's not on some cloud after you die. Right. Out here, samsara. In here, nirvana. And eventually we integrate the two. Right. We, we integrate the snow white and the seven dwarfs. So, mm -hmm. yeah. What do we take away? Meditate and then you can do anything. Have fun. So is it all the same story? You know, ultimately, it's the same story. It's the same search. It's the same mm -hmm. desire. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, the uh, somebody once years ago wrote: "There's really only two stories in the world: uh, uh, Jack and the Beanstalk and Cinderella." You know, the is the kind of the archetypal male quest and the archetypal mm -hmm. female mm -hmm. quest. Um, uh, but I, I like your version. Really, it comes down to 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 one story, right? Yeah. And the, and the, yeah. and the, and 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 the story is is, you know, it, it's all a game of of tag. And finally, we go, oh, tag, you're it, and oh, this is me tagging myself. But you know, if if we're going to the movies in search mm -hmm. of infinity or whatever mm -hmm. it is, mm -hmm. um, you know, to satisfy this desire. Once we realize that, are we then going to stop going to the movies? No, then then it just makes it richer. It makes you don't you don't have to stop. You you can stop doing anything. You can stop eating the ice cream. But you don't have not. to. You can you it, it 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 it's fine either way. You know, this is the the one of the very common sort of misconceptions about awakening is oh, it means d denying the world. Um, but what it means is that it becomes everything in the world becomes optional, optional. You're you're no longer going around like little Oliver Twist, you know. Please, sir, I want some more. We're no longer needy, no longer depending on these outer things to fulfill us. But more and more, our our cup runneth over. We become uh, kind of sources of fulfillment for. We we find that everywhere we go. Mm. It means life just gets a lot more rich, a lot more fun. You you cover um, you know so many great movies, uh, Casablanca, um, but you know one of the my favourite sections was Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Yes, um, that I thought was yeah, that really you know mm -hmm. made a mark there, and we mm -hmm. really don't have much time to to go into that one. But is there you know something quickly that you could tell us about? Yeah, that's that a, that's a good chapter for people to read who've been, especially if they you've been involved in a any spiritual organization. Which, by the way, that phrase "spiritual organization" is an oxymoron. Um, yeah. But yeah. Um, uh, you know, you go into the organization. If you start following the teacher, you see the thing is all your highest expression. The, the, as some kind of expression, giving some kind of form to your quest for this highest thing in life, this highest freedom. And then at some point, uh, maybe before you realize it, it's kind of turned into the opposite. You know, it's turned into something restrictive. It's turned into, um, uh, you know, just one more set of, of, of leg irons. How, how, how did this happen? Um, and and the, you know, there was so much in in the film, the original version, the great 1950, what is it, 56, 57 version of Invasion of the Body Snatchers, uh, directed by Don Siegel, um, that so much that felt familiar to me uh, f with some of the experiences that I've had with spiritual organizations that were you know lovely for a while, and then I realized, uh oh, I got to get out of here before I become one more soulless replicant yes. of myself. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, and you do write about that in the book, uh, and very interesting mm-hmm. it is too. I think, you know, um, that movie was made, as you said, back in the 50s. Um, we didn't have the internet then. We didn't have social media. And yet, mm-hmm. as I'm reading it today, I can see, you know, invasion of the body snatchers, invasion of the mind snatchers. It's yes. reflected in today's society. Yes. It's what we see in so many of our youth who walk around, you know, tied to this screen in their hands and and never look up to take notice of the world completely zombified often yep you know there's a there's a uh, a condition that orthopedists call dowager it's a terrible term dowager's hump because it was Mm -hmm. classically just seen among older women where they get this kind of and they're starting to see it on teenagers now and from walking around with their head at that you know that's a big weight there your head at that 45 degree angle so so one one more tip for folks is if you're going to spend time on your phone at least hold it up yeah 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 you know at the close of our show in april when we were discussing dharma bum's guide to western literature i mentioned jorge luis borges's book books and i something that he said when writers die they become books um, which is, mm. after all, not too bad an incarnation. And I asked mm. you if that was true. What would you, you know, what book would you become? Let's take that question and turn it around. If film critics become movies when they <laughs> die, what kind of film would you become? Oh, geez. Um, or any particular film? Yeah. Um, I don't know, maybe Wings of Desire. Why? Um, Short why? Oh, geez, wing, wing, wings of desire for people who haven't seen it. You've got to see it. It, it, it Ber, Berlin in the days of the wall. Angels who are tall men in trench coats with ponytails finding people who are in distress and invisibly whispering in their ear, telling them the thing they need to get out of their distress, their depression, their suicidal ideation, and whispering it, and the people think it's their own thoughts. That would be a pretty good place to go. Yeah, yeah. What a great metaphor that is. Dean Slyther, thank you for joining us today. I'm sorry we couldn't dive deeper into some of these movies, but uh, I honestly encourage you to read the book. It's very enlightening, which is what you set out to do. Yep. Thanks for joining us, Dean. Thank you, Sandy. So we've been discussing Dean Slyther's book, Cinema Nirvana, Enlightenment Lessons from the Movies, which is people have said, a very funny but wise, practical and wildly entertaining guide to finding enlightenment one movie at a time. For more information about Dean Slyter, his books, events and his free online meditations, visit deanslyter.com. That brings us to the end of this week's show. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer and I'll be back at the same time next week. Till then, it's goodbye from me. <laughs>